A crisis faces Europe. Winston Churchill, proud of the Admiralty, declares, the world is ar has never armed before. Okay. For the answer, we must go back to 1879. Bismarck, Iron Chancellor of Germany, knows that France wants revenge for her humiliating defeat in the Franco-Prussian War. To thwart her, he seeks alliances. Austria, whose ruler has ambitions in the Balkans, is receptive to Bismarck's scheme. So Austria and the Reich sign a secret military agreement pledging reciprocal aid if either nation is attacked. Three years later, in 1882, the agreement is extended to Italy, which has ambitions in the Mediterranean. Thus, the Triple Alliance is formed. Backed by a military force of more than two million men, the Triple Alliance dominates Central Europe from the Baltic to the Mediterranean. 1900, William II becomes Emperor of Germany. He dismisses the ruthless but cautious Bismarck and launches an aggressive foreign policy of Weltpolitik. Germany, says the new emperor, must take an important place in world affairs. The Kaiser dreams of a German-dominated Central European Empire linked with Asia by a Berlin to Baghdad railway. This road, controlled by the Russia, is to run through Austria-Hungary, Serbia, Bulgaria and Turkey, and thence to Asia. Only tiny Serbia, outside the German orbit, blocks the grandiose scheme, and Austria's ruler will gladly cooperate, if necessary, in crushing the little Balkan nation. But the Kaiser must reckon with France and Russia, which have become alarmed at Germany's growing power. In 1892, these nations signed a secret military agreement of their own, pledging mutual aid should either be attacked by the German combination. Diplomats call this Franco-Russian pact the Dual Alliance. The Kaiser must also reckon with King Edward VII of Britain and British sea power. England is jittery because the German combination, plus the collapse of the Ottoman Empire, has upset the balance of power in Europe. In addition, Germany is making sealing battleships. Feeling herself menaced, England seems ready to line up with France and Russia. 1904, overlooking her traditional jealousy of France, England signs a pact whereby Paris and London agree to work together in foreign affairs for their mutual advantage. This pact is not a military alliance. Its friendly character is indicated by its name, the Entente Cordiale. Nevertheless, it gives the Kaiser something to think about. Three years later, this agreement is extended to Russia. The Entente Cordiale thus becomes the Triple Entente. The Kaiser is furious. He claims that Germany's enemies seek to encircle her. As extra irritation, Italy, his Triple Alliance partner, comes to an understanding with France and Russia. Thus, Italy has a hand in each of the rival European combinations. In the event of war, she can join the side that offers most. Morocco, 1905. Europe's first war of nerves is underway. Germany bluntly questions France's right to expand in Morocco. An international conference follows, and the matter is decided in favor of France. In 1908, Emperor Franz Joseph of Austria-Hungary announces the annexation of Bosnia and Herzegovina, a blow to the nationalistic ambitions of Serbia. The Tsar of Russia backs Serbia as a sister Slavic nation and an enemy of the Central Powers. He protests Austria's action and is supported by England, but Germany sides with Austria. Russia, weakened by her war with Japan, has to yield. So Bosnia-Herzegovina is recognized as Austrian territory. It is a great diplomatic victory for the German combination, but it breeds hatred and fear in the Serbs. 1911, another crisis over Morocco. Germany sends a warship to Agadir and informs France she has no right to annex Morocco. England quickly sides with France. David Lloyd George, now Chancellor of the Exchequer, speaks for the British government. Says the Welshman, if peace can be maintained only allowing Britain to be treated as if she were no account in the cabinet of nations, then I say emphatically that peace at that price would be intolerable. But war over Morocco is averted when Germany receives concessions in Africa. 1913, crisis in the Balkans. King Peter of Serbia, following a victorious Balkan war over Turkey, orders occupation of several ports on the Adriatic. The Austrian government takes alarm. A strong Serbian state might draw millions of Serbs from within Austria's borders and start the downfall of the empire. Austrian troops are dispatched to the border. 
The Kaiser also is worried. A strong Serbia would threaten his Berlin to Baghdad dream. Russia again backs Serbia. Once more the war clouds loom. But again they dissolve. England and Germany persuade the Serbs to evacuate the Adriatic ports. An independent state of Albania is formed on the coast. Serb leaders are denied their cherished ambition and outlet to the sea. Meanwhile, the munition makers have been very busy. In Germany, France, England, they turn out guns, shells, warships. Selling to potential enemies as well as friends, they have armed Europe to the teeth. And so again, 1914, Europe still hopes for peace, but is ready for war. June 28th. Archduke Ferdinand, nephew of Franz Joseph and heir to the Austro-Hungarian throne, is assassinated with his wife in Sarajevo, capital of Bosnia. The killer is a Serb, but an Austrian subject. Austria blames Serbia and public feeling mounts rapidly. The Kaiser assures Franz Joseph he will stand by him regardless of what action Austria decides to take. Days pass with no action. Then, on July 23rd, Austria-Hungary, influenced by the German military clique, sends an ultimatum demanding that Serbia accept within 48 hours terms which practically mean national extinction. Frantic diplomatic activity follows. Counseled by Russia and England, Serbia yields to most of the demands and offers to refer the rest to arbitration. But July 28, Austria, urged on by Germany, declares war on Serbia. Thereupon, Russia mobilizes. But the Tsar promises the Kaiser to keep peace as long as a chance for peace remains. August 1st. Russia refuses to suspend mobilization. Germany declares war on Russia. France says she will do as her interests dictate and mobilizes. Italy remains neutral, for the Triple Alliance binds her only in a defensive war, not an aggressive one. Germany now demands that Belgium grant her permission to cross Belgian territory to invade France. August 3rd, Belgium refuses as Germany invades France. England, bound by treaty to defend Belgium's neutrality, essential to her own security, demands assurance that Germany will respect it. But Germany invades Belgium. August 4th, England declares war on Germany. The First World War has begun. In the West, German troops follow a prearranged plan. Smashing through Belgium, they drive deep into France. Paris, by October, the Germans shout. City after city falls. In the east, German troops under von Hindenburg crush the Russians at the Battle of Tannenberg. Then they invade Russia. The ill-equipped and badly led Russians become demoralized. In France, the Allied forces with their backs to Paris rally at the Marne and force the Germans back to the Aisne River. A new type of machine gun and trench warfare begins. The fighting reaches a deadlock that will remain for nearly four years as other nations enter the struggle. Montenegro, Japan, Portugal, and Romania join the Allies. But Turkey, straddling the strategic Dardanelles, joins the Central Powers. In 1915, the Allies win a diplomatic victory. Italy comes in on their side. The war now involves most of the world, with the exception of the Americas. War on the sea. In the Battle of Jutland, Germany tries to break the British blockade that is slowly strangling her. But British sea power is too strong, and British warships continue their patrols. So Germany resorts to unrestricted submarine warfare. In 1915, a U-boat sinks the Lusitania. 1,200 people, including 104 neutral Americans, are lost. The United States protests. Germany maintains she has no recourse but to continue the subsea warfare. American public opinion, aroused by the sinkings, plus Allied propaganda, financial and business interests, and German sabotage, becomes increasingly bitter against the Reich. Finally, President Woodrow Wilson severs diplomatic relations between the United States and Germany. On April 2nd, he addresses Congress, recommending that America declare war to make the world safe for democracy. April 6th, Congress passes a resolution which declares the United States and Germany are at war. Other neutrals follow the American example. They are Panama, Cuba, Siam, Liberia, China, Brazil, Guatemala, Nicaragua, Haiti, and Honduras. 
the conflict begun between Austria and Serbia has spread over the world. March 1917, revolution in Russia. A long oppressed people rises against the Tsar who is forced to abdicate. Bolsheviks led by Nikolai Lenin and Leon Trotsky establish a communist regime. With Russia racked by internal war, they are forced to conclude a separate peace with Germany. Prolonged negotiations culminate in 1918, the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk. Under the treaty, Russia loses half a million square miles and 65 million people. She surrenders Poland, Lithuania, Kurland, Livonia and Estonia. She renounces all claims to Finland and the Ukraine and recognizes their independence. She gives up Erevan and cars in the Caucasus and the oil port of Batum to Turkey. She also agrees to pay Germany one and one half billion dollars. During the peace negotiations, Latvia, Finland, Lithuania, and Estonia declare their independence. Brest-Litovsk, one of the most humiliating treaties in history, completes the collapse of the old Russian Empire. Victorious in the East, Germany again takes the offensive in the West. Her troops smash through to the Marne. Allied forces again fight with their backs to Paris. But, led by General John J. Pershing, nearly a million American troops are now in France. They help slow the German drive. July 18th, Marshal Foch, commanding the combined Allied armies, declares, everyone is to attack as soon as he can for as long as he can. A great offensive forces the Germans to withdraw from their dearly won positions. Again, the Marne is the scene of an Allied victory. The fresh Yankee troops hearten the weary Allies as Foch, in one mighty effort, throws his full strength into battle. The advance continues in the face of stubborn resistance. News comes of victories on other fronts. On September 29th, Bulgaria surrenders. On October 31st, Turkey signs an armistice. November 4th, Austria-Hungary quits, and prisoners taken in the relentless advance stream to the rear. In Germany, the people are faced with starvation caused by the British blockade. Revolution breaks out on November 9th. The Kaiser abdicates and flees to Holland. November 11, 1918, an armistice is signed when delegates of the new German Republic meet Marshal Foch at Compiègne. The war is over. Crowds celebrate the end of the bloody struggle. It remains only to draw up the terms of peace. In December, President Wilson sails for France to conduct the negotiations for the United States. Wilson's 14 points were the basis for the armistice, and he now believes his idealistic dreams of a just peace and a strong League of Nations will prevail. At the historic Palace of Versailles in Paris, statesmen assemble to draw up the peace treaties. In January 1919, the first meeting of the peace conference opens. Here, Wilson insists that the League of Nations be an integral part of the peace treaty. And here he learns of the secret treaties concerning the spoils of war. These treaties, which include promises to Italy and other powers on the Allied side, threaten Wilson's ideals of a just peace. Also threatening them are the demands of embittered peoples and statesmen to make the Germans pay. The conference is dominated by Lloyd George, Wilson, Clemenceau of France, and Orlando of Italy. The Italian presently withdraws, leaving the others to carry on the work. July 28, 1919, the Treaty of Versailles is signed between the Allied powers and Germany. Let's see what this treaty does. First, it deprives Germany of all her colonies. German East Africa goes to Great Britain and to Belgium. The Cameroons are divided between Britain and France. British also get Togoland. Southwest Africa goes to the Union of South Africa. Germany's Samoan Islands go to New Zealand. Our Pacific Islands, north of the equator, plus her rights to Kiaochow and Shantung, China, go to Japan. Her islands south of the equator, plus German New Guinea, go to Australia. On her western front, Germany restores Alsace-Lorraine to France. Her front districts of Mornay, Eupen, and Malmedy go to Belgium. Her Saar district, rich in coal, is to be League of Nations with provisions for 15 years to or German ownership also agrees to demilitarize the left bank of the Rhine in a zone 32 miles deep. 
on Germany's eastern front, Wilson's principle of self-determination is attempted. Poland is re-established, and districts inhabited chiefly by Poles are handed over to Poland. To give the Poles access to the sea, the Polish corridor is provided, separating Germany from East Prussia. This corridor is criticized as a certain source of future trouble. In a plebiscite between Germany and Denmark, Helmingly German becomes a free city under league protection. Upper Silesia is to hold a plebiscite to determine Polish or German ownership. The German city and district of Memel goes to Lithuania to provide that new state with a Baltic port. Minority problems arise at once, with Poles and Germans occupying many of the same districts. Poles come under German rule, Germans under Polish rule. As another humiliation, Germany admits she started the war. To indemnify the Allies in money and materials for all the damage caused is also added in the treaty. The money indemnity alone amounting to $31 billion. Germany is compelled to limit her army and navy and to abolish conscription. The Reich has been stripped of her wealth, her colonies, and her power. The first job of the peace conference is done. The Allied powers ratify the treaty. President Wilson returns to the United States and tours the country, seeking to arouse public opinion in its favor. He pleads in vain. Aware of the document's faults and fearful of entanglements, Congress rejects the treaty and the League of Nations. Meanwhile, additional pacts lop territory off other defeated states. The treaties of Saint-Germain, Neuilly, and Trianon deal with Austria, Hungary, and Bulgaria. The new state of Czechoslovakia already has declared its independence. Bohemia and Moravia, the bases of this state, contain three million Germans. To include them will affront the principles of self-determination. To exclude them, it is thought will fatally weaken the new republic. So a compromise bounds Czechoslovakia by the mountain ranges of ancient Bohemia. Thus, Czechoslovakia not only includes a German, but also a Hungarian minority. Yugoslavia, which also has declared its independence, presents another difficult problem. It combines Serbia with Bosnia and Herzegovina, plus land inhabited by Croats and Slovenes. The boundary with Austria is settled by plebiscites. But the bordering territory of Istria and the nearby territory of the southern Tyrol, with its population of 400,000 Austrians, become the pawns of expediency, for they are handed over to Italy, starting more minority problems. Fiume becomes a free city like Danzig, but thus, Little Serbia becomes great and finally gains access to the sea. Romania presents more minority problems. She demands Transylvania, where Hungarians jostle Romanians, and the treaty makers finally give it to her. Thus, another million Hungarians are alienated from their homeland. The former Russian territory of Bessarabia, which has voted for union with Romania following the Bolshevik uprising, is allowed to continue as Romanian territory. So Romania expands greatly by the war. Bulgaria adds her quota of minority troubles. By the Treaty of Neuilly, she is forced to yield territory to Romania, Yugoslavia, and Greece. After further negotiations, Greece also takes over Bulgaria's Aegean coastline, leaving the little kingdom a landlocked nation. The boundary between Austria and Hungary is determined by plebiscite, and the dual monarchy is split into separate independent nations. By these treaties, Austria is limited to a small landlocked territory. The fears of Franz Joseph are realized and the disintegration of the great dual monarchy is complete. Finally, there is Turkey. The first peace treaty, that of Sevres, leaves her little more than Anatolia. Its terms are so drastic that the rising Turkish nationalists refuse to accept it. But the Allies are tired of fighting and so Greece alone goes to war with Turkey to enforce the pact. Greece can't beat the sick man of Europe, however, and so in 1923, the Treaty of Lausanne is drawn up. Its terms are harsh, but less so than those of its predecessor. In Euro, Turkish provinces of Constantinople, Eastern Thrace, and Gallipoli remain in Turkish hands, while in Asia, Turkey retains Cilicia and Adelia, but Syria goes to France. Palestine goes to England under mandate system. Most of the Dodecanese islands go to Italy, and from other Turkish territory, three semi-independent Arab states arise under the protection of England. They are Iraq, Transjordania, and the Hejaz. With the signing of this treaty, the First World War is officially over. Further disputes or ramifications are referred to the League of Nations. 
summer 1923. A new Europe, a hopeful world, a prospect of enduring peace. But already tomorrow's leaders are toiling and scheming for jealousies and hatreds still smolder in the hearts of men. These leaders will fashion new armies to replace the old. They will regiment whole peoples for conquest and revenge. For the new map of Europe is hastily and in places roughly drawn. The task of the peacemakers is not done. Europe's history does not end at Versailles. The ultimate effect of the First World War awaits the question mark of the future. Uh -huh.